Hi, give me 15 minutes and let God change your life. My name is Dr. Will. This show is called Common Knowledge is Not So Common. Thank you for tuning in. I know God has something special for you today, but 15 minutes is all I'm asking. So please stay tuned. Perception is everything. That's what I was taught when I was a child growing up. My dad used to always say, son, perception is everything. And so I would just listen to my dad. And I would just see what he was talking about. And I would see, I would see people that looked like they had fancy cars and nice clothes. And I said, wow, they must be rich. And then I would ask my dad, I said, dad, you said perception is everything. He said, yeah, but that guy got a nice car. That guy got fancy clothes, but he's actually living in that car. And he doesn't even have a home. And I was like, what? I thought you said perception was everything. You know, <laughs> my dad had to teach me. He says, well, son. You really got to look at it, look at it, not for face value, look at it for face value. And then I said, hmm, seems confusing to me, but thank God I'm a Christian. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong unto us and to our children so we can obey all the words of the law. And I realized some things are secret, but God knows and he can always reveal those things to me. And so I started saying, Lord, help me understand about perception. And how we can miss it. Because I see this guy with a nice car, beautiful clothes. And I'm just like, oh, he's rich. He's wealthy. And the reality is he was living in his car. And I was like, wow, did I miss that one? But God knows he was living in his car. And he could have told me that way ahead of time. Well, that brings me to a Bible story. Because when I was looking at the word of God, I said, uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, that whole chapter talks about Naaman. This is a man that was revered throughout the country. He had status because he was a soldier. He was a captain of an army. He was well respected, won many battles, but he had this one little problem. He was leprous and leprous were not allowed to even be around people. He caught that. And I was like, man, here's a guy that was up here and was revered by the people, acknowledged. People looked up to him. But when he got leprosy, that takes his status from being on high to very low. <laughs> and I was like, wow, God allowed this to happen in this man's life. And the perception of the people, if they would find out that he had leprosy, they would have been devastated because he was revered throughout the country. They knew who he was. He was famous. He was a, a strong captain who won many battles and the people look up to him. So why is this important? Again, we're talking about a man's perception. He was like, man, I'm all this. I have status. I have a position. I'm recognized in my society. People revere me. People look up to me. I have all these worldly possessions, but I have leprosy, which causes all that to go away. In this time period, if you were, were found with leprosy, you were banished from the city and you had to go to a place off to the way to the side. And the reason why is because they're not like medical facilities that we have today. They didn't have a cure for leprosy. The only way you would get cure from leprosy is God had to touch you and you had to be healed by God. And that was rare and far between. Now, please don't get caught up because the fact is we have the Bible. And so many times when we read the Bible, we read the back story, meaning we know what's going to happen. But if you take the Bible as if you're looking at it right then, right there, this man was devastated. All that he had, all that he accomplished was going to be taken away from him because he had this disease. And so he was looking for something to actually change, to help him out where he wouldn't have to be banished from society. Now, let me show you what happens when you have leprosy during this time period. If you had leprosy, you had to yell out to people that come close to you and say, lepers, 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 get away, get away, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. Which is shameful, belittling. It's actually a humbling experience because people looked upon you as less than. You're unclean. So we have a man that's up here with status, 
known throughout society, had many possessions and belongings, now is down here having to yell out he's unclean. He was looking for a solution. He was looking to get healed. And his wife had a, a, maid, a handmaiden that said, there's a man of God in town. Maybe you can ask the king to go to him and he can heal you. And so he took this maidservant's recommendation, went to the man, went to the king. The king said, that guy? <laughs> he don't even want to talk to nobody. He's always doing what the Lord tells him to do. But the king said, if you want a letter, fine. He signed the letter, gave it to him. And Naaman goes to the house, traveled around, went to the city where the prophet was at. They knocked on the door. And to their dismay, the servant answered the door and said, I asked the prophet. The prophet didn't even come see Naaman. Now, remember, Naaman was the type of guy, if he came to your house, you would definitely go to the door because you were scared of what he could do to you. He had that much power, that much uh, authority, because he was a captain of a major army. And he was not just somebody. He was the man wherever he was at that time period. The servant came back and said, my master says, go dip in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be healed. Immediately, Naaman gets upset. There's so many other cleaner places I can go dip in. There's so many other bodies of water that I came through. Why do I got to go dip out of here and blah, blah, blah. And because we're talking about status. Naaman thought he was all that. But he didn't consider his position of leprosy. See, once you get leprosy and you get shamed in front of the people, you're down here. It's a different status. Or... Once you are poor and you're always poor, your perception a lot of times is down here. You don't even look up there. But see, God is quick to change the tides. He's quick to even humble you. And Naaman was complaining and moaning and grumbling. First of all, he's mad because the prophet never came to the door. Second thing, he's got to dip in this dirty water. He's like, I don't want to do all this, blah, 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 and complaining. But he had a person with him and said, well, master or captain, just do what the prophet said. And we know the moral of that story. He was healed. But what if he wouldn't have done what the prophet said? He would have lost everything, never been restored, would have been a bitter, bitterness and resentment would have been with him all the days of his life. Because if he was complaining about the prophet not coming to the door, what do you think was in his heart if he never got healed? He would be grumbling and complaining with God because he didn't get delivered. In fact, right now, some of you are complaining now because you have a disease and a sickness where the Lord told you to change your style. Stop smoking. Stop eating these foods. Stop doing this. You need to exercise and you chose not to. Now you're mad at God because of your health where you are at now. It's so sad. God always gives a salvation, a way to restore yourself. But it's up to you to be obedient. I don't ever want any of you listening right now to be like Naaman. Learn to be obedient. Be quick to do what God's telling you to do. Now, this brings up another story where we talk about perception. And this is about Jesus, the man of God. Now, Jesus in Matthew 15, 22 through 28 Jesus was going along. You know how Jesus does. Everybody's running after Jesus. Everybody's always calling on Jesus to do a sign, a wonder, or a miracle. But in this particular case, there was a woman screaming and hollering for Jesus and was doing everything she could to get to Jesus, and the disciples forbid her, saying, get away, get away. Now, that might not seem like a big thing to you, but realize women were looked at as less than dogs or at the same status as a dog and a dog was as pretty low as you can do go. It's a little higher than a leper. So <laughs> I'm just trying to give you a perspective of culture and time period. And so the disciples said, get away, get away. Well, she broke through and finally came to Jesus. Jesus looks at this woman and says, woman, why should I take the children's bed, bread and give it to a little dog? <laughs> I don't know how you'll feel about that, but here's this woman 
Her daughter was demonized. Her only hope for her to be set free was through Jesus Christ. And Jesus, when she finally gets to him, she's looking at him for the Savior, and he calls her a little dog. In other words, he belittles her, puts her down. And she just, wow, can you just imagine that? Here's the one that you've strived for. Here's the one that you came to see that you knew could set your daughter free. And he looks at her and says, hmm, should I take the children's bread and give it to little dogs? Did she get in bitterness and resentment? Did she cuss Jesus out? Did she give Jesus a what for? I dare you talk to me that way. You don't realize what I'm going through. She didn't say none of those things. She said, Lord, even the dogs eats the crumbs from the table. Right then, Jesus stayed from this way. Your daughter shall be healed. And she was restored. Now it's amazing. We're talking about perception is everything. Jesus, even though he was the son of God, he was raised in the Jewish culture. And the Jewish culture looked upon women that way at that time period. She probably was a Gentile because he called her a little dog. That means she's less than. What do I have to do for you? But Jesus' perception was tainted by his culture. But Jesus still marveled and revered that woman when she responded. Even the crumbs from the table, the dogs are going to be able to eat from. And so that is awesome. Even though we see Jesus see something, he changes his whole perspective. So we always left to look at the scripture. Don't look at it in hindsight. In other words, we know the backstory because we're reading the Bible. But look at it and say, oh, Lord, if I was living this right here, right now, like in my life, there's some of you listening right now going through a hard time. They're going, you're going through changes right now. You need some answers. And I challenge you. Ask the Lord about Deuteronomy 29, 29, those secret things that you need revealed to you. God will show it to you. And he'll set you free. But look at your heart. How is your heart right now? Are you holding bitterness and resentment? Are you holding that hatred? And are you blaming God for what you're going through right now when he can restore you? Are you complaining because things aren't going your way? People, look, we don't think about the breath we take right now because it's something that we do all the time. We don't think about our ability to walk. A lot of times we just do it. But all that's through the grace of God. The fact that we can breathe, the fact that we can walk, the fact that we can just do the things we do is only by the grace of God. And so when I say take 15 minutes and God can change your life, I'm taking that 15 minutes. I'm hoping God will change your life. And may God surely will bless you. Right now, I just ask you to take the time to bow your head. And I'm going to pray for you. Father God, those people listening right now, I just ask, Lord, that you would touch their heart in a special way. That Ephesians, um, Philippians 3, 26, that they forget the things of the past and press on the high calling of Christ Jesus. Realizing that that bitterness and resentment they're trying to hold against somebody else is only the devil using them so that they can hurt other people. And they have to learn to forgive. And they have to look at Ephesians 4, 26. Rid yourself of all bitterness and malice and resentment and hatred and love each other as Christ loved the church. And Christ died for the church. Die to that bitterness and resentment. Don't let that be in your heart. Remember again, Naaman. If he would have never dipped in the Jordan River those seven times because it was dirty to him, he would have been cursing probably God till his death because he would have never been restored. And some of you right now are cursing yourself, holding bitterness and resentment against people because of your present situation. And God wants to restore you. And I just declare and decree that God's blessing will be upon you and he will restore your heart. Now, in Jesus' name. Well, I hope this 15 minutes changed your life. I know some of you will be changed just if you get this deep down in your soul. And God will do awesome things with you. Well, until next time, this is Dr. Will with Common Knowledge is Not So Common. This 15 minutes God could use to change your life. Share that 15 minutes with somebody else. Until next time, be blessed. Bye-bye. In 1789, John Wesley gave us the principles of money. Earn as much as you can, save as much as you can, and give as much as you can. 
These principles bring prosperity, protection, and peace of mind and assure financial success. We're making this valuable resource available without cost or obligation. To get your biblical rules of money and enjoy the blessings and rewards of financial stewardship, call 800-723-8349. That's 800-723-8349.